Here we're gonna look at a nice problem involving the floor function. So I've got a whole playlist on equations with the floor function and stuff. I don't really know why. I just somehow like things involving the floor function. So our goal here is to find all real numbers x such that the floor of x squared plus one equals the floor of two x. And I wanna recall really quick that the floor of x is defined to be the greatest integer less than or equal to x. So I like to think about this as like an elevator down to the closest integer. So the floor of like five and a half will be five because you gotta go downstairs. The floor of 7.999 will be seven because you have to go down. The floor of negative one and a half will be negative two because you have to go down and so on and so forth. Okay, so the strategy that we're gonna use here is to solve this without the floor function first. Then that should give us a hint about where the solutions probably lie, then we'll find solutions in that region around the solution without the floor, and then prove there are no solutions outside of that spot. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's go ahead and do without the floor, this becomes x squared plus one equals two x, but now notice that that is the same thing as x squared minus two x plus one equals zero, but that nicely factors like x minus one squared equals zero, which tells us that x equals one is the only solution without the floor. So that gives us some motivation for our solution, and by our solution, I mean the one that involves the floor function should be around x equals one. And I'm gonna put in quotes around because I'm not gonna carefully define that or anything. Okay. So now what we want to do is examine what happens if we're far away from x equals 1 and show there are no solutions there. So maybe we'll break this into cases. So case number 1 will be x is in the open interval minus infinity to 1 half. And then maybe it's an open interval on the side of 1 half as well. So what I want to notice here is that we have x squared plus one is gonna be bigger than or equal to one. In fact, x squared plus one is always bigger than or equal to one. But that tells us that the floor of x squared plus one is bigger than or equal to one. But with this setup, we have two times x is strictly less than one because we're not including half in the upper bound for this inter interval. But what that means is that the floor of 2x is less than or equal to zero. But now what we want to notice is that these two conditions are incompatible. So it's impossible to have equality there. And that's what we need. We would need equality there for that to work out. So we've got no solutions in this interval minus infinity to half. So now we want to be inspired by the fact that if you take two squared and two times two, you get the same thing. But for all values of x bigger than two, taking the square is gonna give you something appreciably larger. So that tells you that when x is bigger than two, this thing on the left is gonna dominate that thing on the right. So that's not a very careful way of doing it, but that does give some intuition for our next case. So our next case, so case two, that'll be x is in the interval two to infinity. So including two. Now what I want to do is place x between two consecutive integers in this interval. So let's do that. So we can write 2 is less than or equal to n, which is less than or equal to x, which is strictly less than n plus 1. Great. But now notice that that means that 2x is between 2n, which is bigger than or equal to 4, and then strictly less than 2n plus 2. But now if we take the floor of 2x, we can change this non-strict inequality to a strict inequality with 2n plus 1 here, and then we still have 2n over here. So notice, including 2n, between 2n and 2n plus 2, not including 2n plus 2, there are only two integers, 2n and 2n plus 1, so those are the values that this floor of 2x can take. And then over here, we still have this 4. Great. 
Now, the next thing that we're gonna do is do a very similar calculation, but on our quadratic portion of this equation. But now we can square all sides of this inequality and we'll have four is less than or equal to n squared, which is less than or equal to x squared, which is strictly less than n squared plus two n plus one. Now we'll add one to it to achieve this quadratic expression right here. So we'll have five is less than or equal to n squared plus one, which is less than or equal to x squared plus one, which is less than n squared plus two n plus two. Good. Now I can go ahead and take the floor of both sides. Notice taking the floor of all sides of this, I'll get five is less than or equal to n squared plus one which is less than or equal to the floor of x plus one, or x squared plus one, which is less than or equal to the floor of this, but this is an integer, but since we have a non-strict inequality, we can exchange it with a strict inequality by looking at n squared plus two n plus one, but that's the same thing as n plus one quantity squared. So now we're gonna put these two inequalities together and that's gonna give us something pretty helpful. So we'll have the floor of two X over here. That's gonna be less than or equal to two N plus one. But notice if N is bigger than or equal to two, we know that two times N is going to be less than or equal to N squared. So we can put a less than or equal to N squared plus one, which is less than or equal to the floor of X squared plus one. And now another thing that I want to notice is this is strict if n is bigger than or equal to three because n squared is gonna be strictly bigger than two n if n is bigger than or equal to three. So what that tells us is that we've got a strict inequality between the two sides of our equation for n bigger than or equal to three. So immediately we see that there are no solutions with um, x in the closed interval three to infinity. Good. And now, maybe as a little exercise for yourself, that means that we need to check the interval between two and three kind of by itself. So I would say, let's check this, x in the interval two to two and a half. You'll see that you'll maybe want to break it up into pieces and then x from two and a half to three. And you'll see that there are no solutions in this case either. So that means there's no solutions here, no solutions here. Now we're gonna maybe clean this up and then we'll start looking for where there are solutions. So far we've proven that there are no solutions on this union of intervals, minus infinity to half, union two to infinity. We do not include a half, but we do include two. In fact, as you can see, we'll check that one half will give us a solution. Okay, great. So now the next thing that we want to do is look at all of the cases in between one half and two. And this may seem like maybe too big of a problem, but as we'll see, it's not too bad if we break it up carefully. So let's go ahead and break it up. We'll break it up into three cases. And so that first one will be X is in the interval one half to one. So closed interval on the left, open interval on the right. And you might say, well, what's the point of this choice? Well, notice if X is on this closed interval, that means that two X is on the interval one to two, not including two, which tells us that the floor of two X is equal to one, which means what we really need to do is solve for the floor of x squared plus one equal to one. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. Notice that the floor of x squared plus one equals one is the same thing as x squared plus one being bigger than or equal to one or strictly less than two. But now notice that that means that x squared is bigger than or equal to zero and strictly less than one, which means that x is between zero and one. Notice we don't need to worry about like taking absolute values here or doing a plus or a minus here because we're already assuming that x is between one half and one. Okay, so notice that our original assumption was stricter than what we got in the other case, which means 
every value of x between here and here is okay. If we had gotten a further restriction down here, then we would have had to intersect, as we'll see um, in the following cases. All right, let's go ahead and do the next one. So the next one will be x is in the interval given by one up to three halves. So let's see, that means that floor of two x equals two, so I'll skip that step in the middle, which means we need to solve floor of x squared plus one equals two, which is the same thing as saying that x squared plus one needs to be bigger than or equal to two, but strictly less than three. But now notice that that tells us that x squared needs to be bigger than or equal to one, but strictly less than two. But that tells us that x is strictly less than the square root of two, but bigger than or equal to one. Good. So if we're on the interval one to three halves, then we're in fact restricted to this interval one to the square root of three, sorry, the square root of two. So that means that we can reduce this from our starting interval to that interval at the end that we calculated, so one root two. Of course, we're using the fact here that root two is smaller than three halves. Okay, good. So now the next thing that we wanna do is our last case, and that last case will be x is on the interval three halves up to two. Good, but in this case, we get two x floor is equal to three, which means we need to solve the floor of x squared plus one equals three which is equivalent to saying three is less than or equal to x squared plus one, which is strictly less than four. Good. But now, notice that that means that x squared is bigger than or equal to two, and it is strictly less than three. But now that tells us that x is between the square root of three and the square root of two. Great. But now we wanna intersect those two conditions. So x being between three halves and two and x being between root two and root three. Notice that this lower bound is more restrictive and square root of three is an upper bound is more restrictive. So that means that here we can replace this with three halves up to the square root of three. So now we found our three intervals, this one, this one, and this one. And those are the intervals where we have solutions. So let's maybe go ahead and write that down. So we have solutions on, so it's gonna be x in the union of these intervals. So let's see, it's gonna be half to one and then um, one to root two. Well, we can mash those together. And so that's gonna be half to root two union, then three halves to root three. So those are the only places where we have solutions. And that's a good place to stop.